Well, thank you and good evening. And thank you for coming. I realize for some of you it uh, took some courage to come. Uh, you're not quite sure who this Nicholson fellow was and what he was going to say. And uh, I understand that uh, you have a busy life and there are many activities that uh, you could be attending. And I appreciate your willingness to come and to think with me uh, through the magnificent blueprint that has been given to us in the Word of God. A few introductory comments. I've included some of these in your notes. I understand that as we look at a comprehensive view of the church, there are many issues that some people would consider controversial. And I certainly am not interested in stirring up controversy or being argumentative. Obviously, uh, we want to deal with the scriptures as we see them. I want to be fair and honest with what the Word of God says as I see it. Uh, but I have no interest whatsoever in demeaning anyone or their position. I want to deal in good faith with all of God's people. Every serious Christian needs to be taken seriously. And I understand that there are issues that we can discuss, but we want to be gentlemanly about it. And we want to appreciate that uh, we are fellow helpers to the truth. And none of us knows it all. And so what we want to do is to open the word of God, let it speak to us, and hopefully, rather than coming and checking off to see if the preacher's orthodox, allow the word of God to speak to our hearts and to show us perhaps areas where we haven't seen things as clearly as we should. And there's an echo in this room, I don't mean the, the sound system, but the truth of God comes around and hits me too. And as I look into the word of God, I, I will be convicted of things that, that I perhaps am a theorist in and not a practitioner. And so I trust that uh, all of us together will be willing to embrace the truth. This is what we read about the early church, that those people who heard the message gladly received the word. They embraced it happily. They didn't make the concession. They didn't yield the point. They responded happily to the truth. And the scripture says that we need to buy the truth and sell it not. David said when he went up to Mount Moriah in speaking with Ornan, he was going to build a place for his God. And so Ornan, a pagan, said, well, you can have it. If it's for your God, you can have it for free. And David said, oh, I wouldn't give anything to the Lord that costs me nothing. I want to pay the full price for it. And so nothing will come of these sessions if we're not prepared to put something on the altar and say, I want to buy this truth. I want it to be real in my life. And whatever truth we buy, it's going to cost us something. If we're window shoppers and we come and hear the truth and we go away with just some talking points, then really nothing will come of this. And so I pray that uh, through the week, uh, the, the two weeks that we have together, there will be some beautiful things that you'll discover out of the Word of God. I can't think of any subject that's more magnificent than the doctrine of the church. And one of the reasons is, the more I study the subject, the more I realize that the doctrine of the church is the doctrine of Christ. All of the portraits that are given of the church are really inconsequential if the Lord Jesus is taken out of it. What is a body without a head? What is a flock without a shepherd? What is a building without a foundation? What is a bride without a bridegroom? What is a branch without the vine? Every picture that's used doesn't simply include the Lord Jesus, but presents him as the vital issue. And so as we study the doctrine of the church, my prayer is that the taste that's left in our mouth as we leave, the, the overall impression on the soul will not be, well, that was an interesting thing, or, but, but we'll leave these lectures with the consciousness there's nobody like the Lord Jesus. And personally, I think that's the path to change, isn't it? Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're changed into the same image. And so I appreciate you coming. And one issue that we're going to deal with a little later in our study is this. There are people who, of course, have very differing views about the church. 
And they would suggest that when we look into the New Testament, what we have there is not prescriptive, it is merely descriptive. In other words, the, the word of God isn't saying this is how you ought to meet. It's simply saying this is how they did meet. And how you meet, well, that's up to you. I'm not going to deal with that issue right now. In your notes, you'll notice under point three of some important introductory comments, I mention this, and I say there the question will be discussed in lesson six. In actual fact, it will be discussed at the end of lesson two. You'll forgive me for this. We were working at this uh, in the wee hours of the night, and uh, I'm amazed that it came out in English at all. Well, I want to think with you, first of all, about the mystery of the church. What is a mystery? A mystery is not a whodunit. Uh, a mystery, in the biblical sense, is a truth which we could never understand if God didn't reveal it to us. And it was withheld from the human race until an appropriate moment in history when God pulled back the veil and showed this magnificent truth. The passage, of course, that deals most often with the subject is found in the book of Ephesians. And there the apostle Paul writes these words in chapter 3, that in verse 3, that the revelation of the mystery was made known to Paul. And he says that revelation in verse 6 is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And he links together two wonderful ideas. First of all, the gospel itself, in verse 8 he says, to me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and, and, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So he held these two truths, these twin truths up, and he said on the one hand, it's been given me the privilege of proclaiming the gospel. The glorious news that those who are without hope, without God, in a moment of time, may be transferred out of that hopeless situation and brought into new life in Christ, that they, in a moment of time, would become part of the family of God, their debt against God wiped out by the cross work of the Lord Jesus, and they would become recipients of eternal life, their feet put on the path to heaven, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the intercessory ministry of Christ, the promises of God all would burst upon their souls in one glorious moment. I was blind, now I see. What a wonderful privilege it is to preach the gospel. But on the other side, he said, equally as wonderful is what he calls here the, the preaching of the mystery, the mystery of Christ. There are about 14 mystery doctrines in the New Testament. And one of the great doctrines is this mystery of the church. And what is it? It certainly isn't that Gentiles could be saved, because in the Old Testament, Gentiles were saved. We have the stories of Ruth and Rahab and Uriah the Hittite and many others. They were Gentiles, and they came into a living relationship with God. But he points out here the distinction. He says that something marvelous has happened. If we go back in the history of the world, I have a quotation here for you from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, which speaks about the three groups of people as God looks down in the world today, the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. The idea being that originally the nations began to develop after the flood and God determined to begin a marvelous program in which he would take one man out of Ur of the Chaldees, uh, an idol worshiper, and he would befriend him. He would reveal himself to him. As Stephen said, the God of glory. 
revealed himself to Abraham while he was in Ur of the Chaldees. And so God selected Abraham not to be Abraham's private God, but that that man and his family and eventually the, the nation that would come from him would become the special vessel that God would use to accomplish his purposes in the world. He would give through that nation the two greatest gifts that had ever been given to the human race. One was the written word of God and the other was the living word of God. In order to do this, God had to insulate the nation of Israel from intermarrying and intermingling with the other races. He had to preserve the messianic line so that eventually the Messiah would come and according to Matthew chapter one would be the son of David, the son of Abraham. In order to do that, God built a wall around the nation of Israel. It's called the middle wall of partition, walling them off from the Gentiles. They had distinctive clothes, they had distinctive food laws, distinctive ceremonies, and they were not allowed to mingle with the other nations. And this was all to preserve the line of the Messiah. But when Messiah came, now God could take down the wall. God began with the whole race, the whole human race. And then it was narrowed down to the line of Shem, the Semites. And then down to the Abrahamic covenant. And then to the Isaac airship. And then to the Jacobite family. And then to the line of Judah, the royal line and then to the house of David, and then to the seed of the woman. And so the purposes of God narrowed down until they all focused on that blessed man who came in the fullness of time. But then what happened? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So that God's selective process of bringing about this purpose was not to keep his blessing with a particular group of people. His promise to Abraham was that through Abraham and this family, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. The whole world would come into the fullness of the blessing as a result of God's purposes. So in Ephesians chapter two, we have this description, how God took down the middle wall and removed that barrier between Jew and Gentile and took two and made them one. And as we have it described here, they became, um, fellow heirs, this is at the end of the first uh, paragraph on page two, fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise. You see in the Old Testament, uh, there were particular promises of inheritance to Abraham's line. That was a big issue, wasn't it? Jacob wrestled with his brother over the inheritance. And the inheritance was an important issue to them. But now all of a sudden, we who were not a people had become the people of God. And not only sons of God, but heirs of God. I know it's hard for us to believe, but the word of God says that I'm as rich as God is he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. We were Gentiles. And so we have been brought in now to become fellow heirs, to share the inheritance of God himself. And then secondly, the same body. An Orthodox Jew would rise in the morning and say, oh God, I thank thee, I am not a Gentile. They spoke of them as dogs. And oh, to think of it, that Jew and Gentile would be brought together in one body. Recently, I was contacted by a group of Arab Christians in Israel who asked if I might come over to speak at a conference which they would be arranging for the Jewish Christians. 
to encourage them. They said they've been through a very hard time. And we want to have a conference and invite them and pay for it all and encourage them. That's not the sort of thing that gets on the evening news, is it? But it's a manifestation of the marvel of the grace of God that Jew and Gentile would be brought together in one body. And then we read partakers of his promise. They were the children of promise. They could point to the scripture and say, but God, you promised. But we were strangers to the covenants of promise. But now we've been brought in to share the promise. And these magnificent promises that we have in the word of God, why, they're for us too. Oh, may we take hold of them. Say, that's to me. God sent that to me. And to lay claim to these magnificent promises that he has given us in his blessed word. Now, the Lord introduced this grand theme. Our brother quoted it in his prayer in Matthew's gospel, where we read, the Lord Jesus took his disciples to the extreme north end of the land of Israel under the shadow of Mount Hermon, and there he spoke to them. And he asked them, who do men say that I am? They were very kind, you know, the disciples. They left the worst out. They didn't say, well, some say you're a drunkard, and some say you're an illegitimate child, and some say you've got a, you're a lunatic, <laughs> you're demon-possessed. They left all that out. And they said, well, some say that you're um, Jeremiah, perhaps because he was a weeping prophet. And some say you're Elijah, perhaps because of the miracles that he did. And maybe John the Baptist, because they had a bad conscience and they hadn't listened to John the Baptist. But whatever the case, he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, having it manifested to him by God himself, said, thou art the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the first of four revelations in Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter um, uh, 16, there is first of all the revelation of the Christ, the Messiah, and linked to that, the revelation of the church. On this rock, he said, I will build my church. Now, make no mistake about it, Peter did not think that he was being given the privilege of being the rock on which the church was built. He himself is the one who tells us that we are built on that wonderful rock, that precious stone that has been cut out not with human hands. He declared himself that he was one of the stones that had been placed on the great foundation of the Lord Jesus. Paul would write, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. And so it was on the basis of this confession of Jesus as the Christ that he revealed to them the truth of the church. And then we have the revelation of the cross. From that time we read, verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16, from that time forth Jesus began to tell them how he was going to go to Jerusalem and he must die. And he revealed to them the truth of the cross. You couldn't have the church without the Christ. But you couldn't have it without the cross either. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a good thing to remind ourselves of that, isn't it? When we're having some difficulties in our local church, just to grab ourselves by the brain and say, wait a minute, this person was redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. To keep reminding myself that the people I interact with in my local fellowship, these people are blood-bought, they are heaven-bound, they are spirit-indwelt, and when God looks down from heaven, he sees them as the most precious thing in all the world. So here, the Lord Jesus makes this declaration concerning his going to the cross, but before we get to the end of the chapter, he, he gives us the fourth C. He speaks about his coming. That he's not going to remain in the grave, he's going to rise again. And he's going to go away for a time, but then he's going to return and he's going to establish an eternal kingdom that will never know an end. These are the four great themes of the New Testament. The Christ, the church, the cross, and the coming. Now, when we try to understand what the term church means, 
Of course, we have all sorts of notions that have grown up over the years. People think of a building as a church, or they think of a particular denominational group as a church, or an organization. But when we look to the Word of God, we discover that the word church is used in a very specific way. It always has to do with people. And it has to do with a certain kind of people. And I've got a quote for you um, in this second paragraph on page two, which is out of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In his introduction, he says, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ. That's the description of these people. They were in Corinth, but they were also in Christ. They had a dual address. They were in Corinth, but they were in Christ. They were in the world, but not of it. They had been called out of the world system, we mean, obviously not out of the geographical world, but they had been called out of that system. When we speak about the world um, in the sense that it's an enemy of the Christian, we mean that place where people are trying to be happy without God world religion, world politics, world economics. It's the substitute for God in people's hearts. And we've been called out of that. And John makes it perfectly clear, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The world is in antipathy to the Father and the Father to the world, and you've got to make your choice. So we who have put our trust in Christ, we who he describes here as being sanctified in Christ Jesus, in other words, set apart for Christ. We who belong to him now, I'm his and his forever. And we who are called to be saints, he says. Of course, some people think that in order to be a saint, you have to have been dead several years and have performed certain verifiable miracles. But the way the word saint is used in the Bible is a person who has been separated set apart from the world and set apart to God. It's really on the same basis of, as the word holy. And the initial idea of holy is to be different, to be set apart, to be distinct. And here we are now, a separate people. We, we have not only been saved from our sin, we have been saved from this present evil world. And we've been set apart for his glory, for his enjoyment. We are to be his eternal companion. Now, I have five girls. I'm really particular about the young men who show an interest in my girls. Can you imagine God, the father? He only has one son, and he has chosen to give us to his son. The first marriage in history was an arranged marriage. You understand that? God gave away the bride in the garden. Adam had nothing to do with the selection of that. Uh, Eve was custom designed for Adam. And you know, history not only starts with a wedding, it ends with a wedding. The grand day that we have described in Revelation 19, the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And that also is an arranged marriage, isn't it? And God is calling out of the world a company for his son. They are not simply to be workers in his business. When Jesus came, he didn't come to hire people to work in his company. He came to woo a bride. And he's far more interested in our love than he is in our service, you know. Now, if he has our love, he'll have our service too. But it will be a labor of love, won't it? We'll want to do it for him. We won't feel obligated or guilty if we don't do it. We'll serve him just because we love him. And that's the key of the happy Christian life. You cannot have... Holiness based on fear or guilt. Holiness is a love relationship with the Lord Jesus. Now, when we see the words of the Lord Jesus, I will build my church. Let's emphasize each word as we go through it. I will build my church. See, that's a bit of relief, isn't it? There are some of you here and you're working hard, seeking to, to build a church. And sometimes we grow weary and we feel like giving up. And we need to hear the words of the Lord Jesus when he says, 
I'm doing it. I I'm glad for your help, uh, your workers together with me. I'm, I I'm happy to work with you, but I want you to understand that this is a program that I began. I designed the blueprint. I paid the price for the product, for the, for the building materials. Nothing will stop me from doing this. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And then secondly, I will build my church. The will of the Lord is that he might have a bride and he is going about doing it. When we go to sleep at night, he doesn't stop working. All around the world, he has his agents and he's right on schedule. He's, he knows what he's doing. And sometimes I think we assume that not much is going on because we don't hear what's happening. But the Bible says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes because he'll reveal what he's been doing. There are a lot of Christians and they're convinced that the Lord Jesus is altogether lovely, but they're not so sure he's done all things well. They think that, well, things have been a bit spotty, you know, and a lot of it hasn't worked out, and a lot of people have been missed in the process. But I tell you, there's a day coming when God will be vindicated that he picked the right man for the job. And oh, the whole world will see that the Lord Jesus did what he said he'd do. The scripture says, I think these words are beautiful, concerning the Lord Jesus in that great servant song in Isaiah 42, he shall not fail nor be discouraged. And I say, well, if he's not discouraged, there's no reason for me to be discouraged. He's right on schedule. I will build my church. I will build my church. That's a good thing to remember, isn't it? Now, Derek Watson has me over to his home to stay. Suppose I, I came in and he said, well, this is your room and, you know, you're welcome. Here's the fridge and, and uh, here's the phone to use and so on. And I say, well, Derek, this is very kind of you, but, you know, this wall here, it just offends me. I don't like that wall. But it's all right. I carry a 10-pound sledgehammer in my bag just for this very reason. You won't mind if I remove the wall, will you? And Derek would say, well, no, actually, that could get in the way of our fellowship. <laughs> I, I kind of like that wall there. And the last time I looked, this house belongs to us, so if you don't mind, just keep your hammer in your bag. You know, there are people who walk into a church and they think that they can bring in a sledgehammer and do whatever they like with it. The Lord says, it's my church. I paid for it with my own precious blood. So I would like you to cooperate with me. I'd like you to work with me, but I really would appreciate it if you'd do it the way I designed it. It's my church, you know, it's not yours. And I want it a certain way. And then he says, I'll build my church. And here we come to this word. What does the word church actually mean? And on page three, I have a little uh, selection there that gives us some of these word definitions. You'll notice that when the term church is used, I have several verses there that speak about the ears of the church. And that's, of course, a rather humorous idea. If you think of ears on a building, it was obviously the ears of the Christians and that the church can pray and the church can be persecuted. So obviously the way the word church is used in the New Testament, it has to do with the people. The church is made of living stones. I've given you a little hint as to the word church itself. It comes from the, the key word is kurios, the Lord, and it mean, means lordly, that which belongs to the Lord. The second word, ecclesia, most of us know a little Greek. We know the word paraclesia and ecclesia. Paraclesia is the word for the Holy Spirit. It means the one called alongside to help. And ecclesia, from kaleo to call and ek out, the idea is we've been called out. So when we're called out of the world, the world doesn't love us anymore. And the world doesn't look after us anymore. But we haven't been left alone. God says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you my Holy Spirit and he'll move in. And you've turned your back on the resources of the world, but I will give you all the resources of heaven in exchange. Is that a good deal? I'd say so. And so the paraclesia comes alongside the ecclesia to help us. The third word is the word assembly, very often the word translating the word ecclesia. And it carries with it not only the idea of called out, but called together. We haven't been called to be loners, to be isolated. We've been called into a new society, a new fellowship 
of the people of God. Now, you can see the three movements of the soul here, can't you? Called out of the world, called out. And then called together into the fellowship of the people of God. But, you know, the church is different than Israel. The Lord Jesus described it as a fold, rules and regulations, a circumference that tried to keep all the sheep together. But he said, it's going to change now. It's not going to be a fold anymore. It's going to be a shepherd, not a circumference, but a center. And your attraction will not be to each other so much. It'll be to me. And because you love me, you'll learn to love one another. And so the church, we have been called out. We have been called together, but we've been called to him. Christ is the gathering center of his people. He's the thing we have in common. And our love and loyalty to Christ is what links us together. We make a distinction between the church and the churches. I've tried to do it through the notes to give a capital C for the universal church. The idea that uh, all the churches, these local gatherings of believers, are part of one grand universal church. We need to make a distinction between the true church and Christendom. Christendom is visible and divisible. But the true church is invisible and indivisible. If we come into a congregation of people, it may well be that in that congregation, God sees there are some that belong to him and there are some that don't belong to him. And he knows every one that is his. The Lord knows them that are his. And so out of every group of people, by whatever name they call themselves, there are true believers there. Why, even at the end we read, God says to Babylon, come out of her, my people. So that there are people of God in various groups there. They, they have been divided by, by barriers, by theological barriers, and by names that they use. But when God looks down from heaven, he sees this great company, and they're his. And that's what links them together. Now, someone has said that the calling of the Lord Jesus to his church to come home is the only ecumenical movement that will work. When all of God's people respond to the call of their bridegroom when he says, come up hither. But in the meantime, we recognize that God's people are linked together by this wonderful unity that has been produced by the Holy Spirit of God. And we'll think about that in our next session. What happened at Pentecost and how did individual believers become one body in the Lord. But I would like to make this distinction that the universal church is composed of every true believer, past, present, future. Most of the church is already home with the Lord. And someday we're going to see that great company, that multitude on high, the spirits of just men made perfect, and the redeemed of the church age. But then there are these local congregations. And the purpose of the local congregation is a very practical one. It's impossible for the universal church to get together until that glorious day when the Lord calls us home. So at the present time, we're gathering in little groups of believers. And the purpose of that is to make the church visible, to have a testimony in the world, to let the world know that there are those whose loyalty and love is to the Lord Jesus. And we have some of these descriptive terms that describe the purpose of God towards the church. Christian, he didn't save you just to keep you out of hell. He didn't save you and bring you into the church just to entertain you on the way home to heaven. God has some big, big plans for his people. And I've quoted some of them here in your notes, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We are the friends of God. We've been brought into the intimacy, the fellowship of the divine persons. On one occasion, Winston Churchill was privy to a conversation on name dropping. And he said, I despise name dropping. I said that just the other day to the queen. Well, you talk about name dropping. Here we are, the friends of God. 
the intimates, the confidants of heaven. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. He's brought us into the big plan. He's linked up with his son. He sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts. And his purpose is to bring us into the fellowship of the divine persons. These are big plans, aren't they? To bring us into the family of God. God had one son. He was so pleased with that son that he had that he was willing to give him up to the cross and all that that meant. That through his death, the Lord Jesus might bring many sons to glory. That he might someday stand and say to his father, Behold, I am the children whom thou hast given me. To be a family with God. And then he speaks of the beginning of a harvest. The corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died that he might not abide alone. Years ago, I was out uh, in a farming community in Saskatchewan, and I was, they'd asked me to speak on evolution and creation to the young people, and I used an illustration. I was talking about uh, the balance of nature and how important it was, and used an illustration that if there were no uh, frogs or fly swatters, in one year, from two house flies, you'd have enough flies to cover the earth 10 feet thick. Well, this man came to me and said, look, you gave an excellent little talk there, but that illustration blew it. There's no way in the world that two flies could produce that many in one year. And I said, well, you know, that's geometric progression. You ever hear the story about the man who invented chess? And um, the, the king wanted to give him his weight in gold, and he said, well, I'd rather have something else. I'd rather you put one grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard, two grains on the next one, four on the next one, eight on the next one, and double it through the 64 squares of the chessboard. I'll take the grain instead. The, thing, the king thought he got off easily, you know. I said to the man, how much do you think, how much grain do you think that was? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let's say um, a thousand bushels of wheat. Do you think it's more than that or less than that? He said, well, probably something like that. I said, well, I'll tell you what, if it's less than one ton of wheat, I'll pay your weight in gold. But if it's more than that, you owe me the wheat. Well, he thought he got off easily because he had a wheat farm. Well, he went back and he started to calculate how much wheat it was. And he, he ran out of digits on his calculator and he had to call up a friend at the university to run it up. It ended up like 105 million metric tons of wheat. And I said, well, you know, imagine if he took the wheat and put it into the ground instead of on the chessboard. This is what God is doing all over the world. Uh, one is planted here, and then they see others saved, and they see others saved. And that single corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died is producing a harvest that is going to fill heaven. My house must be filled, he said. That solitary man who died at Calvary that gave us this magnificent harvest. And so these beautiful expressions of the purposes of God, watch for them as you read through the New Testament. Look for these clues, what God has in mind for his people, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be exhibit A to the grace and mercy of God. Don't be too flattered. That just means that God had to reach down into the into the pit and pull you out of it, take you out of the dunghill to set you with princes. It's like the dubious honor of being the, um, the most improved student, you know? <laughs> he's taken us from the lowest place and he's given us the highest place, right there with his own son, seated with him on his throne. Oh, to think of it. I tell you, we, we'd almost think it was a fairy tale that someday we'll have to get used to the new feel of a crown and that we shall be the ruling class of heaven, the royal family of heaven. Now, in this little section on page four, the design, form follows function. You learn that in your biology class that when God designed the bird, he designed the bird to fly, so he gave it hollow bones. And when he designed the fish, he designed the fish for the sea. Well, when he designed the church, he designed it not capriciously, but he designed it specifically to function in this world. We're behind enemy lines. We have been sent into the world behind enemy lines, and the, the objective 
is that we might invite those who are rebels against the king to lay down their arms and to join us on the way to heaven. It's not an easy thing. It's a, it's a major challenge, isn't it? And yet God has designed the church in such a way that it is persecution-proof. The way God designed it. You go into China, I was there in January, and you see millions of Christians. They estimate that China is now 5% communist, 10% Christian, and the numbers keep going up. And in spite of their attempts to stop the church, all they've done is spread it. They put them in prison, and then everybody in prison gets saved. So they say, we better spread these people out, you know. <laughs> well, all they're doing is transplanting the gospel until it's spread through the world. Everything the enemy tries to do, well, ends up for God, doesn't it? He ends up, I mean, he, he doesn't mean to be an evangelist, but he's so hard on people, he drives them to Christ. And the work of God continues apace. We look around and think, well, not much is happening. Well, the Lord says, no, no, I'm building my church. So when we think about this magnificent design that God has made, he has revealed this truth to us in the New Testament in five different ways. First of all, as word pictures, and we'll think very briefly about those this evening, Beautiful word pictures. They're a bit like a, a, a quick pencil sketch of a friend. You know, they say that good art is like good morals. It has to do with drawing the line at the right place. And when you draw the right line, it, you don't need many lines to catch a person's character if you draw the right line. And so God has taken the church and he's drawn some few, a few very simple sketches of the church. They're just an outline, so to speak. They are metaphors of the church. And then secondly, there's historical na narrative. The church is rooted in history, and the book of Acts is the story of the early days. And in our next study, we're going to transport ourselves back to that first century, to that little company of believers gathered in the city of Jerusalem, with the Sanhedrin plotting to destroy them and the Roman Empire rising up with its mighty forces trying to choke the life out of the church, and the gates of hell scheming and plotting to destroy the Christians. And we see them marching triumphantly across the Roman Empire until there were millions that had been brought in to the glorious truth of the cross. Wonderful to see it. Uh, they, they didn't have uh, printing presses or faxes or emails or photocopiers or automobiles, and yet resolutely they went across the empire until Paul could write, every creature under heaven had heard the gospel in their day. They fulfilled the great commission. Now when we read the book of Acts, we think that was the early church. It was just a few Christians. It was Paul and a few friends. What were the other 8,000 Christians doing? The very same thing. And the world heard the gospel in that first generation. They have found the ruins of first century churches as far as Mongolia and China and India and all the way over to Spain as the gospel spread in that first century. You see, those early believers, they thought that when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that what he really meant was, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So they thought, well, if he thinks it's doable, I guess that's what we ought to do. And they went out and they did it. Now, they can't do it for our generation. You see, they're gone. And every generation is a terminal generation. Uh, we have a whole new generation to reach with the gospel. And the Lord Jesus has commissioned us to do it. And so this historical narrative is going to be very helpful to us to see their united plan, their strategy, as they went out. They didn't go haphazardly. They went out to preach the gospel to every creature. And we're going to look carefully at that historical record of those early days and how they gained the gospel momentum and the gospel swept across the world. And then number three, we have intercepted letters. We, we are allowed to listen in on the correspondence between great men of God and fledgling groups of Christians. Now there's something very encouraging about this because when we read these letters we discover 
that the Christians got into absolutely every possible problem you could get into. Isn't that good? <laughs> because that means that we have the answer to every possible problem you can get into. The word of God is sufficient for all matters of faith and practice. It's able to equip us for every good work. So when we look at these epistles, we see the heartbeat of faith. We see the reality. We see, I mean, Paul will be writing and all of a sudden he'll just break into a prayer. He'll interrupt himself in writing and he'll say, I've just got to pray for you. And so he, he copies out his prayer right in the middle. It just breathes with life, doesn't it? When we read these epistles, we see the passion and the depth of knowledge they had of the things of God. You know, most of them didn't have Bibles. It cost about $150 a page for a Bible in those days. They didn't have software. Computers didn't have Bible software. They didn't have commentaries. They didn't have Bible dictionaries. But they had a heart for God. And they longed to know more. And they would take those little, those little letters and they'd pass them around and just about memorize the truth that was in them. But we see the fullness of the truth of God in these epistles, the richness of it and the passion of these early believers. Now, in these epistles, we also have sections that are pastoral teaching. They, they carefully lay out divine precepts, and these are invaluable for the church because they're inspired by God. They're not just good ideas from men. These are inspired by God. And they're going to be very helpful to us in seeking to discover what the church was like. And then, of course, we have the very words of Christ. The very words of Christ. In Revelation 2 and 3, the Lord Jesus visits seven churches and he evaluates them. It's very, very solemn, isn't it? And yet very encouraging. And we'll see his word to the overcomers a little later in our studies. So we have in this little section ten word pictures. The bride the temple, the body, the family, the flock, the field, the pillar, the lampstand, the house, and the vine. These pictures, as I say, are, are brief sketches, but every one of them emphasizes something different about the church. Uh, the virgin pict pictures for us our devotedness to Christ, our affection, our heart affection for the Lord Jesus. We're in love with him. Is that what marks out your life? Is that what marks out mine? When people think of us, they say, well, I don't know a lot about, he's not a very clever sort of fellow, but he sure loves the Lord. Is that, is that what people think of when they think of you? He's a lover of Jesus. Is that what they think of our local churches? If, you, if I went and knocked on the doors of the neighbors round about the building where you meet, and I said, these people down the street here, what, what would you say about them? Well, I don't believe what they believe, but they sure believe it. They, you know, they really love Jesus. <laughs> Is that what they'd say about us? Well, that's the purpose of this little picture. This young woman who's madly in love with someone, who keeps herself from anyone else that would rob her of her affection, and her heart is all for him. The, the temple or the building, well, there's a plan here. You ever seen a man build a building? He thinks, I'll, I'll go and do a little building today. And he comes over and he throws a stick here and a, a, a roll of uh, a tape over there. And he, he puts a few wires over here and a brick there. And No, no, no. He's got a blueprint. And he, he builds in a certain orderly fashion, doesn't he? Well, there's a plan here that God has given to us on how to build for eternity. Not for time, but for eternity. The family, love and loyalty. The flock, dependence on the shepherd. The field, the need for personal growth, the pillar and ground of the truth, holding up the truth. Isn't it beautiful? Don't be ashamed of the truth. It's a beautiful thing. You know why? Because the truth is in Jesus. He is the truth. And this world is dark and getting darker every day. And it's the privilege of the church to hold up the truth above the rabble, above the arguments and all the silly things that people say. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men to me. That's what we need to do in our gospel preaching, in our public ministry. We need to say, isn't he wonderful? And hold up the Lord Jesus. It's the role of the church to do that, to lift up the Lord Jesus. Are we doing that in our communities? This year, did people 
learn more about Christ from your local church than they did last year? I mean, do they know about him? Is he the best kept secret in town? This is the role of the church. These portraits are so important, and I encourage you to look at them in some detail on your own. In this first study, I've tried to emphasize not so much the mechanics of the church, we're going to think about that a little bit, but the, the dynamic. In other words, not so much the form, and we'll get to those things, but the, the driving force, the heart of the early church. Oh, how they loved the Lord Jesus how they loved the gospel, how they loved souls for Christ, how they loved the word of God and loved each other. We need to get back to that, don't we? That, ma that passion for God. And so I leave this with you as we, as we come to the close of this first study. Whatever else to say about the church, it's absolutely nothing without the Lord Jesus. He's the one who paid the price for it. He's the one who planned it in the first place. He's the one who laid the foundation, who laid his glory in the dust, who laid down his life that he might become the foundation on which our lives are built. He's the Lord of the churches. He's the great high priest who prays us home every step of the way. He is the message we preach, the gospel we proclaim. He is the link between brothers and sisters that makes us one and helps us to get along with one another. From beginning to end, the church is all about the Lord Jesus. And you know, there's a day coming when you look at me and it'll make you think about him. When God has finished the job, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. May the Lord encourage our hearts in these studies never to get too far away from the Lord Jesus, to keep our eyes on him and to learn again that what God is doing in the world today, you never hear it on the evening news, but God is drawing out of pagan cultures, of animist religions, out of, out of every tribe and tongue and people, a gathering of poor sinners saved by grace and he's building them together, a glorious church that someday will be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And when we see it's all done, we'll stand back, we'll fall at the feet of the Lord Jesus, and we'll say, Lord, you did it. How did you do that? We were so uncooperative, so slow to learn. We kept wandering off, saying the wrong things and doing the wrong things, and yet somehow you've triumphed gloriously and you finish the job. Oh, may God encourage us to have confidence in him and confidence in the plan and the design that he's given that we might embrace the truth and say, I just want two things in my life. I want to know what he wants, and then I want to do it. Shall we pray? Our Father, we look forward to that day when, as thy word declares, the one who is able to keep us from falling will present us faultless. We don't feel like that now, but we know that the Spirit of God is not going to give up on us. He is with us until the day of redemption. He's going to keep working, and when we give up, sometimes in the struggle, he doesn't give up. He goes on fighting against the flesh, resisting him, and rescuing us, and changing us little by little, almost imperceptibly to us, changing us to be like thy son. And someday it's going to happen that we shall arrive home in glory and we'll be like him. We'll fall at his feet and the story repeat and the lover of sinners adore. And we'll realize then he has done all things well. We thank thee for every child of God. Wherever they meet, Whatever they have learned of thy word, whatever measure of light they have, the whole family in heaven and earth, every one of them a miracle, rescued from the forces of the enemy, redeemed by precious blood, bound for glory, equipped with a gift to be used for the blessing of thy people. Oh, what a plan. Oh, what a plan. We thank thee for including us, sinners of the Gentiles, and making one glorious church. We owe it all to that man at thy right hand, a prince and a savior, 
and pray that as we take a little break now and visit together, our fellowship will be sweet, not only sweet to us, but as thou dost look down from heaven, that it will thrill thy heart to see thy people enjoying the Lord Jesus together after it cost thee so much to provide it. And as we would gather for some discussion of these things, help us, Father, to, to only want to know thy will and then to do it as we ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen.